My psychosomatic self-healing journey began five years ago with one specific practice. It wasn't journaling or meditation. It wasn't a gratitude list or gentle stretching to the sounds of relaxing frequencies. It was silently screaming, shaking, and trembling beneath a cold shower every morning before heading to university. I didn't know too much about the mechanics of trauma at the time, but I did know that if I didn't go ahead with this weird morning practice, then my everyday mental well-being would rapidly degrade by nighttime. Occasionally, and on really good days, I'd have enough proximal privacy where no one was in the house and I could allow myself to make noise, to actually articulate the pain, never really with a loud scream, I was too closed in for that, but making enough noise to let the edge off. When I look back, and even when I say this now, it's actually life-saving and miraculous that I gave myself enough permission to calm down that judgmental inner critic who would deem this practice too weird or unnecessary. Because although I was the kind of young man who was really into cold showers for self-motivated, self-enhancement and self-development purposes, the very concept healing, the very word healing even, was so unpalatable to me because to admit that I needed healing would, re would require an admission that I was fragile and weak in places I didn't want to look. In the years since this shower screaming experience, I've been fortunate to actually commit to the healing process and multiple years of research and personal experience and eventually client experiences where I'm supporting people has helped me really become proficient about psychosomatic self-healing. And that's what I'm going to try and share with you today. I want to go about it from two angles, which you're seeing being previewed on the screen right now, and they look rather different. The one is very cathartic and very intense, and the other is a lot more subtle, a lot more nuanced, and these are the two approaches towards somatic self-healing, releasing the physical tension and accumulated baggage in our body, which have their various benefits and drawbacks depending on the challenges at the time. And I'm going to focus on this as the main essence of this video because it really is just the two main paths and they blend in some ways but in some ways they're quite distinct. But before we get into the conversation of healing the trauma, we need to understand the mechanics of trauma, which is why I'm going to begin with a quote from today's Inner Work Essential in an unspoken voice by Peter Levine. It's quite a long quote, but I think it's the perfect introduction for this video because it really frames the concept of trauma along the two main avenues of development, chronic trauma and acute trauma. So here we go, again, in an unspoken voice by Peter Levine. Highly traumatized and chronically neglected or abused individuals are dominated by the immobilization and shutdown systems. On the other hand, acutely traumatized people, often by a single recent event or um, no repeated history of trauma, neglect or abuse, are generally dominated by the sympathetic fight or flight system. What he's saying here is that you have the chronic trauma and you have the acute trauma, and they tend to suffer from flashbacks and racing hearts while the chronically traumatized individuals uh, I'm awful at reading quotes today. The chronically traumatized individuals generally show no change or even a decrease in heart rate. These sufferers tend to be plagued with disassociative symptoms, including frequent spaciness, unreality, depersonalization, and various symptomatic and somatic health complaints. I really butchered that quote. Excuse me. That was awful. It's um, because it's the light's too bright, actually. I can't see the page so clearly. Nonetheless, if you want to get past my bad reading and read it for yourself, I highly recommend it because this is Peter Levine's magnum opus. I think it's about 20, 25 years into his career of working with trauma, and he goes into far more concepts that I can't even go into in this video. He really is one of the masters and the best, the best introduction that I found into the space. If you've heard of The Body Keeps the Score, that is, I wouldn't say garbage, but not the appropriate book if you want to really get into the space. So, chronic trauma and acute trauma. 
what does this mean when it's stored in our body? In two general lanes, we have the chronic, consistent overst overstimulation and threat of being in an environment, usually a family environment, where safety is never an option. This is the example of the young boy or the young girl who has an abusive father, mother, sibling, and it's that constant feeling of unsafety which bottles up as words not spoken, a heart that's closed off and withdrawn, and a general withholding, a general smallness that you have to be careful where you step. It could also be a relationship, right, where you chronically are under tension and stress. Acute trauma, more typically, is something like a car accident or, a, you know, a, a, a horrific sexual incident or something where there's a definable moment, maybe a war experience. Complicatedly, acute trauma can happen within a complex traumatic environment. For example, you could have an abusive relationship that's generally chronically tense, but then has moments of acute trauma where a boundary is crossed and pain is magnified. You could also have a warlike situation or an unsafe neighborhood where you feel chronic low-level tension, and then occasionally there's a hyper-aroused, intense moment where something really bad happens. It's important to understand which type of trauma we're dealing with. In terms of my own personal history, I had to mainly focus on chronic trauma, which is the feeling of being in a family environment where I could never truly feel like I could let my guard down. And there were moments of acute trauma where tensions would rise and there'd be vocal or physical transgressions which caused a moment of immediate pain. But in all honesty, those moments of intense adrenaline are far less poisonous to the nervous system, at least in my experience, than multiple years of low-grade stress. This is the wound that is always slightly trying to close and then is ripped open again. It's a scabbard that's ripped off rather than the broken bone. The broken bones are horrific, but the majority of people that I've seen dealing with trauma on a physical level, they have this chronic element. If you want to learn more about the specific mechanics of trauma and how it stores in the body via various nervous system responses, endocrine system responses that go into full detail about the attachments and all of the science behind it, again, read this book. That's why I recommended it. I don't think it's necessary to actually go into it to start working on the traumatic response, however. So let's start talking about that, shall we? We've got the cathartic approach and we've got the subtle nuanced approach. Which one do we use depending on our circumstance, right? Well, initially, the pattern I see with client work especially is that in the first few weeks of working with someone is when, when the safety is established at least between um, me supporting and, and them receiving and they feel like they can actually relax a little bit. Typically, it's a lot of, a lot of anger and a lot of sadness. It's quite explosive. It's the screaming. It's the crying. It's the stomping. It's the smashing. It is the destructive life-preserving instinct, which usually, and unfortunately in most cases, was stifled down in childhood when a certain parental figure or family figure or cultural figure took away their autonomy. This is the scream that affirms life. This is years of accumulated tension in the throat, anger in the hands, maybe even something like an, arthrit an arthritic condition or an autoimmune disease where all that rage and all that tension gets turned inwards when it doesn't get the outwards expression. Cathartic, somatic self-healing. Again, depending on chronic or acute trauma, it, it still has its place. Generally, it's more for chronic trauma because there's so much accumulated in there. That's actually the first step. And it's the most difficult step because it's the weirdest. It's easier in a one-to-one -one container where, for example, I might be supporting you and I am fully present as someone who's gone through the experience, but to be alone in a, a dark room usually, or maybe somewhere out in nature, maybe with a mirror, and actually give yourself the permission to look at all that pain and let it come through as a shake or a tremble or a cry or a scream, that takes so much courage. 
and it's so life-saving. So I really encourage you to do that if that's the stage that you're at. When it gets to the next stage, we tend to go towards the subtle. There are some instances where people need to begin with the subtle because it's actually a much quieter and yet no less significant desire for love or desire to push away. I'm going to bring a personal example in to demonstrate. The reason that subtle and nuanced trauma release through physical expression comes after the catharsis is that the initial electric charge that leaves then gives us the clarity of mind to focus in on the deeper current of disturbance. So for my own personal history, five years ago I started screaming in the shower silently, then about three years ago, four years ago, three years ago, I started having more openly vocal experiences, and I went through a very intense period of needing to go through all kinds of impact therapies and highly masculine, I guess you could say, um, rebirthing rituals, self-rebirthing rituals, really going through, fasting is another element of that, but going through a somatically connective and liberating process. But what came next in the last two years was all of the nuance and the subtlety. And this is the dancing and the slow expression. I was never a dancer. I was an awkward, clumsy child and teenager and very much afraid of anything that could be deemed effeminate or gay based on the culture that I grew up in, which is, you know, not the best culture to begin with. So the way that I got into these subtle movements was through reading the traumatic literature and understanding the importance of nuanced gesture. This is something that Peter Levine talks about as titration, which means to introduce a, a certain movement pattern um, over time. Actually, Peter Levine is not the best person for this. There are people like Moshe Feldenkrais, um, the authentic movement somatic fields, and also bioenergetics, which is the theme of the next video, which go into this far, in far more detail. Levine's more about PTSD-like symptoms. Um, anyway, the dancing and the subtle resolution. This is when we get to complete the incomplete gestures which symbolically and metaphorically retell the story of loss and trauma. It might be hard to wrap our head around this to begin with, but our body knows the wisdom. And the reason I know this for certain is that for about five months, of my dancing in the woods practice and animal movement practice, which began as monkey movements and bear movements and reconnecting in with a, a primalness, which was strong and sexy, right? It's strong and sexy to do, like almost choreographed athletic movements. That's where my way in was from cathartic movements and identifying as like an athletic, strong young man, to then being in like the almost athletic, but kind of a bit more artistic animal movement space. It then evolved into just pure contemporary style dance, but initially it was very soft, very subtle. It was a lot of, it was two movements actually, two specific movements, and it will really reveal my history to you, so welcome to me. But hopefully it indicates the, the path that you could go down as well after the catharsis. My initial movement was this. I would be dancing, and I'd find myself hugging around myself. It wouldn't necessarily be a full arm embrace. It might be like a hand over here, or hand over there. And the second movement, I'll try and move back so you can see this. It's always a pouring of the heart. Occasionally I'd, I'd withdraw in, but usually I'd look up, normally towards the sun, and I'd pour I pour my heart out. And that movement continued spontaneously in these dances for months, and then it stopped. The same with the hugging. It came to resolution. And this goes back to the concept in the previous episode of Inner Work Essentials, that healing is ineffable. You can't really understand what's going on, but looking back, if I try and decipher it, it's wanting to be held, and it's wanting to give love in a way where it's received kept wanting to pour my heart out, and I kept wanting to be embraced and to be safe. And of course, it doesn't take a psychotherapist to realize that is an unmet childhood need, which I was trying to self-fulfill through movement. And to a large degree, I did. 
because when it comes to somatic therapy, it's about restoring safety in the body. So we take out that initial energetic traumatic charge through catharsis. The body's a little bit more safe, a little bit more, a little bit more of a peaceful zone rather than a battleground, right? And then we get to the nuanced position where we can start finding those unmet needs. For me, it was open heartedness and feeling physically embraced. And then we get to a point where we are actually capable of re-inhabiting our body and choosing a place of self-identity within our body because it's no longer toxic and uninviting. We become less heady, more hearty, and more visceral. And this is really the second element to somatic self-healing, and actually it's the very next video in this series. What happens when you've released the initial traumatic charge and you want to reverse the disassociative tendency, well, if you've followed through on what I'm re recommending in this video, probably for a few years, realistically, but a few months, I've seen massive progress in people that I've worked with for just a month, for example, of daily work. You have the opportunity to reverse that disassociative tendency and come back into a body that feels good. So if you want to learn how to do that, then click on over to the next episode of Inner Work Essentials, where we're going to take the bioenergetic approach to self-healing and complement everything that we've uncovered here and take it to the next level. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll see you over there.